Thank you, Noah, for the fine introduction. It's a pleasure for Chris and I to be here tonight. I'm going to give a short little overview of concussion. Chris is going to follow up with his session, and then both of us are very enthusiastic about fueling your questions for as long as they keep coming. Largely through Chris's efforts, and I think this is, I get asked a number of times, when's the tipping point when suddenly concussion became so topicable, when, when parents suddenly wanted to know more about it? And I think back to the time that Chris wrote his book. I think back to the time that Ted Johnson went public. I think back to the time that Alan Swartz uh, started writing his now over 100 columns. Uh, in the New York Times about the subject of concussion, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and head trauma in athletes in general. And what has happened now is that we've gotten a tremendous amount of exposure with regard to the problems, but unfortunately, the science, as science often does, is creeping along. And there is a lot more known now than was known 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, or even five years ago, but there still is a great deal uh, to be learned. This statement is reflective of that in the sense that during the past seven years, the practice has been too prevalent of allowing players to continue playing after a concussion. It's true this year, it's still true. Well, this statement obviously is one that could have been made last week or last month or last year. But this statement wasn't made last year. It was made in 1937 before even I was born by one year. And the point is that people have known about concussions for a long time. This was a football coaches association meeting at which this statement was made. And yet the science of it, the recognition of it, really hasn't taken off until Chris and his advocacy took this public in the last few years. We define concussion as a transient alteration in state of consciousness with coma being on one end or unconsciousness, which is rare in athletes. Less than 10% um, of athletes will have a loss of consciousness with their athletic concussions. And on the other hand, just being a bit stunned or a bit quote unquote dinged, it's still a concussion. It's either an alteration in level of consciousness and or can simply be one of 25 or 26 post-concussion symptoms that in temporal relationship to head trauma occur, like having a headache, being dizzy, being lightheaded, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise, so on. Concussion and subconcussive injury occurs without a visible marker, either on MRI or CAT scan, at least routine MRIs and routine CAT scan, usually is not associated in the minds of most with a demonstrable structural brain injury, rather is thought of as a metabolic injury. But if you were to ask me to come back in five years, we may not be saying that because in the brain bank at the Boston University uh, School of Medicine's uh, laboratory, Dr. Ann McKee has actually looked at a concussed individual who tragically died several days after his concussion, uh, not of the concussion, and his brain was studied and there was diffuse, mild axonal swelling, axonal injury. So probably in some individuals with concussion there is a structural abnormality that we're just not seeing with the current sophistication of imaging studies, though that hopefully will change in the near future. We can think of it as this injury in which there is a chaotic shift in ions within nerve cells. Potassium should be in the cell. It comes out of the cell. Uh, calcium goes into the cell. This all happens at a time when there's a massive release of neurotransmitters from the end of axons, it occurs during a period of time where there is a paradoxical reduction in blood flow to the brain when the brain is in need of hyperglycolysis and ideally would like to have more blood flow. 
So you can think of this as a metabolic injury. You can think of this as an energy crisis. And that is why cognitive and physical rests are the hallmark of treating a concussion and managing a concussion. So that during this period of vulnerability, you don't tip nerve cells over that aren't functional but still alive to being dead because you've exceeded their metabolic demands. So we have concussion. We have concussion with symptoms that last greater than a month. That's post-concussion syndrome. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Chris is going to show you some examples of it, which is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that usually becomes symptomatic decades after an individual uh, ends their athletic career, though that is not in all cases. A few years back, wearing our hat as the medical director for the National Center for Catastrophic Sports Injury Research, we were involved with a paper with regard to catastrophic injuries, and of that group of individuals, 39%, more than a third, were plain symptomatic from a head injury they sustained that season. That was a few years ago when this paper was written in 2007, or at least published in 2007. I fear there are quite a few people still plain symptomatic today. I certainly hope that it is far less than a third. And educating the athletes to the risks of that uh, are one of the ways that I think we can reduce that number. With regard to concussion in general, there are a number of free materials largely available through the CDC that can bring you information about what a concussion is and how a concussion can be man managed. And as I indicate, these, these materials are all free. The CDC is co-branded with a number of governing bodies for almost every sport, there more than 35 now, with cushion-specific um, materials that are available. And they're all free from the CDC at 1-800-CDC-info or cdcinfo at cdc.gov. And I suggest this resource for any individuals wanting free materials. Also suggest sportslegacy.org as another rich website of inf information about concussion, concussion management, concussion treatment. The NFL, to their credit, now has in every locker room of, ev of every team concussion posters that inform the players of the symptoms of concussion, of how a concussion should be managed, and why they should report their symptoms. So the NFL has taken a very proactive stance in recent years, since January of 2010, in the education business of concussion for their own athletes. But what should, and I would rather use the word must, an athlete know about concussion? An athlete must, in my opinion, know what the symptoms of a concussion are and what the signs of a concussion are. And they must know that it's important to be aware of that because if you have them and you try to play through your concussion, you run the risk of not only post-concussion syndrome, you run the risk of second impact syndrome, not just at the high school level where most of them have been reported, but they have been reported in college-aged individuals as well. And the athlete must learn the importance of physical and cognitive rest in terms of not aggravating their post-concussion symptoms, not prolonging their post-concussion symptoms, and in some instances, not converting them into a lifelong problem. Brain has a lot of different parts. A lot of different parts have different functions. Parts of the brain, frontal lobe, is involved mostly with insight, judgment, multitasking. Temporal lobes are involved with impulse control, with memory, with our emotions. We've got coordination in our cerebellum. We have vision in our visual cortex, um, motor strip up in the parietal area, and right ahead of it, pardon me, right behind it, the, the sensory uh, cortex as well. So different parts of the brain have different functions. And that's why, depending upon what part of the brain is injured, 
The symptoms can be any one of these 25 that you see in front of you, or 26. Those that are in yellow are the most common ones. Memory issues, concentration issues, and feeling in a fog are all temporal lobe functions and reflect injury in that area. Headache is rather nonspecific. Dizziness suggests problems with the cerebellum and or the labyrinthine connections with the inner ear. And drowsiness uh, is, an, is a problem in the reticular activating system. What should a team physician know? They must learn how to recognize and evaluate an injury. And unfortunately, most physicians didn't learn this in medical school because it wasn't taught in medical schools. If they took a sports medicine fellowship, they probably picked it up. If they went to some meetings that were focused on athletic head and spine trauma, they, they may well have picked it up. But in their regular training in school, unfortunately, most, didn't, most were not exposed to this information, and therefore there may be a dearth of information available to them as a result. Physicians need to know about what should be important in managing concussions must know about when it's safe to return an individual uh, to sport, must understand the gradual progression of return to play guidelines, and of course the final decision of letting one back. And this is the puzzle that physicians need to think about. They need to think about the concussion history, how many concussions has somebody had, how severe were they, how close together were they in time. The closer together, the greater the worry, the greater the period we're going to keep somebody out. They must use the symptom checklist and go after all of those symptoms, not ask somebody how they feel, but one after the other, either have the individual fill it out or ask them those questions. Do you have trouble with sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise? Do you have trouble falling asleep? Do you sleep more? Do you sleep less, et cetera? They should understand the mechanism of the concussion because many of them happen because of poor technique. And if the athlete understands that their technique is wrong, they can change it and have a chance for not having future concussions. Cognition is one of the more common areas of symptoms after a concussion. It's certainly one of the most important in the sense of our memory, our concentration, our multitasking, our executive function. Um, but it's only one area. It is very, very well tested with neuropsychological test batteries and I strongly recommend, when available, and if baselined, that those neuropsychological tests be used as the final step before you allow somebody to go back and play after sustaining a concussion. Unfortunately, these neuropsychological tests are often over-leaned on. They must be understood that they are only one tool in the toolbox. And if you would believe Chris Randolph and Steve Broglio, their sensitivity and validity uh, is only in the 60 percentile area. There are others that have found their sensitivity and validity higher than that. I tend to think those studies are probably closer to right, but what's important is they're not infinitely correct, can never be used alone, and in my practice have many, many patients that pass their neuropsychological testing okay, because their temporal lobes were working just fine as were their frontal lobes, but they still had visual issues, still had issues with uh, other symptoms such as sensitivity to light and noise, may have balance that was off. In other words, their brain was still injured, it just wasn't the frontal temporal lobe connections that was injured. So you can't use these as a standalone red light, green light. What parents and coaches should know and it's important for the coaches to know it because they're going to see it on the field. And it's important for the parents to know it because the parents, especially at the high school level, more so than college, of course, the kids are home at night, the kids are home on the weekend. They may be symptomatic at night or weekend on the weekend. They may actually have their concussion away from sports on the weekend. Fall off a bike, fall off a horse, whatever, automobile accident, et cetera. And that needs to be brought to the attention of the medical personnel at school if indeed it, it happens, and indeed if there are any symptoms at all, that should be done uh, as well. So what's new in this arena? 
In 2008, the third international concu uh, concussion conference was held, this one in Zurich, and out of it came some recommendations, the biggest of which is that any athlete symptomatic of a concussion under the age of 18 should be withheld from play or practice, should be pulled out of any game, should be pulled out of any practice, and should be cleared by medical personnel with capabilities of managing a concussion before they're allowed to go back. The National Federation of High School uh, Football Associations has also gotten in the act with new rules, and the American College of Sports Medicine has also put together a summit in the last couple of years whose purposes include collaborating on concussion and youth sports, preventing injuries, making sports safer, going over return to play considerations, providing educational materials through grants to the CDC, a number of organizations, the American College of Sports Medicine being one of them, the National Football League being another, NOXI being a third, are actually funding these educational materials that the CDC puts out for free. In addition, education about concussion, advocacy, and working groups on guidelines for state legislation also came out as action plans from the American College of Sports Medicine. What's new at the high school level is that any athlete who exhibits any signs or behaviors consistent with a concussion is automatically out of that practice and automatically out of that game if it occurs in a game and cannot be uh, returned unless an appropriate healthcare professional makes that determination. There's no same day return to practice or play after a concussion. The evaluation must be by an appropriate healthcare professional who must do the clearance. Concussion at the high school level is now a serious issue. It's an issue that coaches are being asked to have concussion education training in addition to the parents and the kids themselves having concussion education training. And, con co and coaches are being asked to learn what are the safe techniques in terms of blocking and tackling that tend to reduce the likelihood for concussion occurring. The High School Federation also has a number of website and educational uh, materials that it has put forward and is available um, to the public and to uh, students as well. The NC2A has also gotten in the act largely because of the lawsuit involving Preston Pleveritz, but nonetheless good things came out of it. Um, Preston was a college a student who, when he broke his hand, was seen by a hand specialist. Not even a regular orthopedist, but a hand specialist. But when he received his concussion, he was never seen by a physician at any time. Return to play without being followed through the return to play monitoring period, and unfortunately suffered a tragic brain injury when he did return that has greatly altered his life. And as a result, largely of that, all Colleges were asked to have a concussion management plan on file, which is written, so that colleges and universities have a plan for dealing with concussion. And that plan ultimately uh, should involve uh, proper individuals trained to um, administer such care. The student athlete also has to sign an agreement that he understands concussion symptoms, and he agrees to report them. And the student athlete understands that if he does have these symptoms, he will be removed from play, but this is the only safe situation. And then athletes with concussion symptoms just don't return to play on that same day, similar to the high school level. NC2A feels, and I certainly would agree, that baseline assessment at a minimum should include the symptom checklist, should include some kind of cognitive assessment, and should include a balance assessment, and I would say include the neurologic exam that somebody is going to use for assessing the individual after an injury. 
because if you're going to be using balance testing as you should, if you're going to be using cognitive testing as you should, as if you're going to be using your neurologic exam and the areas of it that are most likely abnormal are the extraocular movements with the plopely or blurred vision on extremes of upward and downward and lateral gaze and or difficulty with convergence so that one sees double greater than eight inches out from your nose or difficulty with your balance or difficulty with cognition, the three main areas of abnormality uh, in neurologic exams, you're going to have to know what that individual's baseline was. Same is true of checklists. People can be depressed prior to a concussion. They can have panic attacks or anxiety disorders. They can have difficulties with migraine. If they have any of these problems and they get concussed, it's invariable those symptoms will get worse and the concussion won't cure them. So when that individual's returned to baseline for them, they're still symptomatic, they're just back at their baseline. And if you don't know that going in and you only figure that this happened after the concussion, um, you can be holding somebody out when it actually would be safe to allow them to return because they have gotten back uh, to their baseline. Serial monitoring of the athlete who is diagnosed with a concussion needs to be carried out. This needs, the athlete can't be left alone while they're on the bench. They should be followed after the contest a decision has to be made, whether it's safe to allow them to go back to their dormitory or whether they need to go to infirmary and be followed more closely. Once asymptomatic, a return to play protocol uh, is put in place and this return to play protocol involves starting with non-impact types of exercises like ellipse, stationary cycles, steppers, uh, flotation devices, running in the deep end of a pool, and then progressing onto that to impact, such as running, uh, and then skills of the sport, and on back. There are now uh, four uh, high school athletes the governing bodies of lacrosse, of, US, of football, of virtually all the major sports, USA basketball, et cetera, have partnered with the CDC to have concussion-specific brochures for them uh, involving the concussion symptoms and what should be done. And this is a great step forward in terms of information for these athletes. The NFL also has taken a very active role, making a lot of changes since Chris and I uh, testified before Congress in the fall of 2009. I'm not suggesting it's because of Chris and I. I'm suggesting there are a lot of factors, but I'm really thrilled at the abrupt about turn that the NFL made in January of 2010. They did away with their old mild traumatic brain injury committee and substituted it with a new head, neck, and spine committee with two fine academic chairs as the chairs of that committee. They've done away with the, with the four-man wedge, um, which formally uh, was in place for kickoffs and put the individual whose job it was to break up the wedge, usually by driving their helmet in the middle of the four people, uh, at great risk of head and spine injury. They reduced it to a two-man wedge, which essentially that activity is not uh, necessary crackback blocks, which are blocking somebody behind you, so it's essentially a blindside block, can't be hit, the person can't be blocked that way above the shoulder pads. If an individual has any symptoms of a concussion, as they're immediately out of that practice, they're immediately out of that play. Now, this is the recommendation. Unfortunately, each team has their own I don't mean it unfortunately, but in reality, each team has their own physicians and not always do all of these guidelines get adhered to perfectly, but this is what the edict is coming down from NFL headquarters. All teams have to have an independent neurological consultant, clear an athlete after a concussion. This is in addition to the team physician. And finally, more recently, kickoffs, as you all know, are now from the 35-yard line trying to minimize the number of runbacks so that the head trauma that occurs 
on that play, which is the greatest one next to the punt in all of football, because the speeds are greatest with two people colliding or many people colliding in some cases, uh, is minimized. Also, there are now penalties, fines, and suspensions, which really hurt the teams in a way that fines don't, um, for hitting a defenseless player above the shoulder pads. You can no longer hit in the head a quarterback. That's not really so new. Quarterback in the pocket. Quarterback is running. He's a runner. He's fair game. But what is new is that if another athlete on the team, if an end or a uh, running back is in the act of passing before he's released the ball and he's hit in the head, that's an immediate foul, that's an immediate fine potentially for any flagrant violations. Anybody in the act of receiving a pass until they've secured the ball can't hit him in the head. Same too for somebody receiving a kickoff, same too for somebody um, receiving a punt. Cannot uh, hit them above the head. Same too for somebody kicking the ball. Can't hit them in the head until um, it, actually you can't hit them in the head or any part of their body in the act of kicking. Um, so the general thought in the NFL is now that any athlete needs to be asymptomatic before they go back. They need to have neurological assessment and then they have a progressive uh, exertional program. All new athletes coming into the NFL do get baseline neuropsychological testing and for those athletes that test is repeated and it needs to be baseline or above. All players in the NFL are encouraged to be candid with regard to their um, symptoms and bring them to the attention of the medical staff. Public service uh, uh, announcements have also become a routine part of NFL games and they're aimed at kids, giving them information uh, about concussions. And finally, the NFL has acknowledged that there is a link between repetitive head trauma uh, and later life issues, the CTE issues uh, that Chris uh, will talk about in just a minute. And finally, in conclusion, I'd like to just simply mention a study that's being done at the Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy at BU. It's just now ramping up. A number of athletes at high risk of brain injury, many of them foot, uh, NFL players, uh, are going to be studied prospectively over a period of time with a variety of imaging uh, markers um, that are right now research tools, but one day might become um, routine in assessing concussion such as functional MRI, diffusion tensor imaging MRI, magnetic resonance spectroscopy MRI, and volume averaging MRI. This study has a team that's made up of a number of individuals from the center at BU. Uh, the principal investigator of this team is Bob Stern, and the, the study will involve other institutions, including Brigham and Women and the University of Pennsylvania. So at this time, I will turn it over to Chris Nowinski and then await your questions. Thank you.